what a day! What a lovely day! All right, I just wanted to take you guys on a bit of a journey here on uh, how I make my knives from uh, stock removal method. This is not going to be an instructional video. Instead, it's just kind of showing you the processes that I go through. I'm going to be abbreviating these things. I'm going to be speeding up the, the, the video on these things to make it a little less boring for you to sit through. So don't take this as instructional stuff. You know, there's things that I'm doing that you're not seeing on camera that really weren't relevant. This part here, this is really the easiest part. This is just taking that bar stock. You're laying out your template onto it. The, the knives that you've made before, you're, you should be doing is making a template. So you're repeating the exact same thing over and over. And the size of your knives and dimensions will all be the same. Your holes for the tang and things like that, they'll be the same from knife to knife. And all you're going to be doing is laying that over the steel after you put the die cut layout fluid on there and then you just trace around it it leaves a scratch mark which you'll see is silver and you know you're just simply playing trace it with the uh, bandsaw this doesn't take any degree of skill um, you know so like I said in the, the, the text portion there that's why I don't blame people that do CNC or water jet for this process because this is laborious you can see the sweat dripping off of me it's just about 120 degrees ambient temperature this uh, this particular day in the shop you know it's you know you're you're wearing yourself out you're putting I don't know a little over an hour into every knife by cutting it on the bandsaw and then shaping it on the grinder and here is that part here once you've got it cut down to almost what your pattern was you're gonna refine that on the grinder here I am using a 60 grit belt to bring it down almost completely to where my traced line was. I don't like to go all the way to it with a 60 because those are very large uh, grits that are on the, the, the belt and that starts in random areas digging in too deep. So what I'll do is I'll bring it about 95% of the way to my final outline and then I'll refine that with a 120 grit belt because that's a lot smoother and I can bring it right down to where it needs to be and I don't have any little chips or chunks that are being taken out from a random large piece of grit on a uh, lower grit belt. So all I'm going to do here is go around the outer perimeter. I'm going to shape it up to where it needs to be. And like I said, I'll refine it with the uh, 120 uh, grit belt. And this just brings it down to what the overall shape is going to be. This is very easy to do. You don't have to worry about heat generating in it. You can literally burn that thing right up because you're working with uh, steel in its annealed state. It's not heat treated yet. You're not doing any damage to it. So you can run the belt fast. You can push in with a lot of weight and hog off a bunch of steel all at one time. And the only reason you see me uh, disappearing there for a second at a time is I'm dunking it to cool it off just so that it's easier on my fingers and I'm not burning my fingers on, you know, 400 degree steel. Um, it's not really for the steel's sake, it's just for my finger's sake. And here I'm just using the standard steel plat and getting my flat areas ground flat. And on all the curved areas, I'll go ahead and use the edge of the plat and just to hog off a whole bunch of steel. And, uh, but not get really too close to my traced out line because I've got to go back with either a small wheel or one of my other uh, contact wheels to get the proper radiuses. Here I am switching over to the 120 grit belt. Um, I'm using worn belts here because this is not the final finish of the knife. It doesn't have to look pretty. This is just getting it to shape. So I can use a worn belt. I don't care if it's so worn that it's generating more heat than it should. Because again, I'm not grinding a heat treated blade. Uh, I'm not concerned with generating heat at this point because it's still yet to be heat treated. So I'm not gonna do any damage to it. Here you'll see me using the small contact wheel at the edge of the platen just to kind of re refine the shape of my recurve. I love doing recurves and uh, that I found has just been the, the best way for me to do it. And uh, I will flip this horizontal because what I want to do is I want to get rid of those grind lines that were going uh, up and down on the, uh, the spine of the blade and around the perimeter. I want to have them running in a straight line from, from tip to butt 
because throughout the rest of the making of the knife, that's the direction that I want my grinds to be going in. So if I start it here, it's a lot easier than after I've heat treated it, and then I'm having to hard grind it, and it makes things slower, it burns through belts quicker, it makes it more difficult, and that's why I'm doing it here. I don't need to, it's something that I could wait to do till later, it just makes my life a little bit easier later down the road. You'll notice here in a second when I hold the knife up, you'll see where the, there's very harsh lines that intersect on the, uh, the spine of the handle. That's something I do on the Hellraiser in the early stages because I want to separate those two areas, the rear of the handle versus the more forward part of the handle. That will be very gently softened toward the end of the build so that that sharp corner, that intersection isn't there. But it'll be basically when I just get to the final grit as I'm shaping that handle at the very end of the build. And that just gently rounds it, but it keeps that definition. It allows you to see, uh, I, I like that look on there. I don't want to make it completely rounded. And I've done that on some Hellraisers where I've made that hump very rounded where you couldn't really see where, you know, one line ended and one line, the other line began. I prefer to have a little bit of definition there that's softly rounded. just drilling my tang holes for the hardware that I'll use to hold the scales on. Just remember, run your drill as slow as your drill press will run when you're doing steel. Use lubricant. Um, extending the life on your drills is, is paramount because I use carbide drills. They're like 50 bucks a piece. You don't want to be wearing them out, dulling them, breaking or anything else too quickly. And here I'm just deburring from where the drill pushed through. That way I've got a flat surface. When I lay this on the magnet to do the surface grinding, I don't have anything where it's, it's pushing part of the steel up without me realizing it. Then I surface grind it, and I end up with a, a knife that's not true and square. I mean, that could be a real pain in the ass and screw everything up for the rest of the build. Here I'm putting on the uh, surface grinding attachment. These are great for fixed blades. They're not accurate enough really for folders, I don't believe. Um, I put tape on mine because when I go to flip the, the steel over, it just prevents it from getting too scratched up sitting on the magnet. Just one of those things that I do. Um, here I'm using a serrated wheel and the belts that I'm using are the Trizact Gator belts. They're, uh, they're structured compounds that are basically applied in thicknesses onto the belt. And the reason I do this is A, it runs cooler plus the serrated wheel helps it run cooler. but. The big thing for me is I want to avoid belt bump. That seam where the belt is connected at the factory. Um, even on an X-weight belt, if I was doing this at 220 grit, which is what this is, um, even a 220 grit belt, you're gonna get some belt bump. Every time that seam comes around and hits the steel, it's gonna dig in just a teeny touch, little bit deeper than the rest of the belt did. So when you go to hand sand it later, you'll actually see the ripples in the steel and it takes a long time to flatten all that out and it's it's unnecessary work to do later. So if you do it right at this stage, it saves you the harder work on your hands later down the road. Especially when if, if you didn't do that till you heat treated it. Oh my god. Yeah, if you go back cuz you're going to you're going to surface grind it after you heat treat anyway. And um if, if you've got ripples in there on hardened steel, you're going to be hand sanding forever and it's just going to kill you. So uh, what I'm using here is an A65. The A65 is roughly the equivalent of, I believe, around a 220. And then a lot of times what I'll do, if I know that I'm going to do a fine satin finish for the end of the project, I'll go ahead and use the A45 belt as well, which is the 400 grit equivalent. That way... When I go to start my hand sanding, I'm not starting at 60 or 120. I'm starting at the same grit I left off at, at 400. So then, if my target grit for the, the hand rub satin is 600 grit, then I just gotta do 400 and 600. Makes my life a lot easier. Here I am setting up on my main contact wheel. This is just to clean up that area on the underside of the handle that I had previously just kind of cut out with the edge of the flat platen. This is gonna make it nice and smooth and all that kind of good stuff. Just start with the 60 to take the big pieces of steel out and then go to the 120 to smooth it out. And 
After this, the knife is fully shaped to what its final form is going to be, and then I'll be ready to heat treat. So there it is. I have the basic shape of the knife the way that I want it. It's not near, you know, refined and perfect and finished right here. Uh, this is something that I used to do. I used to leave that finger choil the way that it is. And I got some feedback from a couple customers going, hey, the knife is great, but I just kind of wish that there was uh, less harsh edges on the forward finger choil. So I started doing this. Um, it doesn't take very long to do it initially, but if you're doing like a very highly finished knife with really high satin finishes or mirror polishes, that I have to keep redoing that over and over and over and over and over. And it ends up being a lot of work, but it's worth it because it's more comfortable in the hand. That most knife makers dread getting to this step. Now, while a lot of knife makers find this to be somewhat cathartic, you can just kind of sit down and do your hand rubs and listen to some music or watch a video and just sit there and, and mindlessly do this. Um, this is actually pretty rough on your body. It's rough on your fingers, your hands, your wrists, your elbows, and especially bad for your neck and for your back. But this is really what separates good knife makers from great knife makers is the amount of handwork that they'll put into their finishing. Now, what you'll notice here is uh, this is just a flat knife. There's no bevels on it or anything else. What I'm doing is I'm setting up for the hand rub satin that I'll be applying on the flats and on the ricasso of this blade. Again, the knife is still in its annealed state. So it's a very easy process at this point compared to when it's been heat treated. And the reason why I'm doing this now, and a lot of makers don't, I do this now at this stage prior to heat treat so that it makes my life easier after heat treat. If I just simply came off the surface grinder at 60 or 120 grit, heat treated it, and came back and had to do all this, I'd be starting at 60 or 120 and having to work all the way up to my final target finish on hardened steel and that's really, really time consuming and rough on your body. Here I'm just marking a couple things with a Sharpie, a couple areas that still need to be worked on so that I have a mostly uniform finish. It does not have to be perfect at this stage because again, after I heat treat, I'm going to surface grind this blade again. Two reasons, one, just to get rid of that, that golden straw finish or whatever else uh, comes out of the heat treat and tempering but also because you might get a little bit of a warp or just a little bit of an uneven area from the heat treating. And a lot of times, if it's not severe, you can take it out by surface grinding it and have a flat and true blade again. So all I'm doing here is just making it a, a preliminary finish so that when I go to surface grind this later, then if it didn't warp or anything else, there was no flex in the blade, I'm gonna go at a higher grit. It's just gonna take off that surface layer of color that the heat treating and tempering added, and then I'm gonna go to hand sand. So again, I can start at 400 grit for my hand sanding instead of two or three grits lower, which adds a lot more time and a lot more wear and tear on my body. I'd like to point out that I'm wearing these shop appropriate Crocs and socks. Crocs are great because if you drop a knife tip onto your foot, uh, that rubber will actually catch it and probably not go through into your foot. They also breathe really well, but I've started wearing socks because if I was barefoot in the Crocs, my feet were getting torn up pretty damn badly. So socks save your skin. And yep, that's as low as I can get the temperature, 96 degrees. That's with the AC running on blast for the past few hours. You can see the sweat all over my hands from being in the nitrile gloves. The nitrile gloves save your skin. You have to scrub their hands a lot less when you're done with work at the end of the day. And yep, time for a little bit of an ice water break. Oh my God, it was so hot. It was about 120 degrees ambient temperature in the shop that day and it was, it was absolute hell. That's okay, next shop, I'm gonna have air conditioning, full on air conditioning. Here I'm wrapping it up in the uh, aluminum foil that we use for heat treating for stainless steel. Uh, that little piece of paper that you see there, I'm gonna be tossing that inside because once this bag is sealed up, um, when the temperature reaches high enough, it's gonna catch that piece of paper on fire 
And when it does, it's gonna suck all of the oxygen out of the bag and create suction. And uh, you'll get a more uniform heat treat that way. So here I am crimping it. Most makers will crimp each of the sides twice. Um, I learned when I was heat treating, the person I learned from says, hey, two usually works great, but by doing a third one, you're pretty much guaranteeing a nice airtight seal. So that's what I do. So I crimp it down. I got this little crimper tool from uh, Harbor Freight. And then uh, I hammer all of it out so it's as tightly sealed as it possibly can be all the way around. And you'll notice when it comes out of the heat treat oven later on, I'm gonna have this beautiful, perfect suction that works out awesome. heat treat oven. Um, I use the Paragon Triple Zone Pro. Uh, it's my favorite. It's the best on the market. One of the downsides to heat treating is you have to stay out there and babysit your oven, you know, so something doesn't happen and go haywire and burn your entire shop down. My is attached to my house, so uh, I don't want to burn my whole house down. So with like, if I was using, let's say, an even heat oven, to get up to the temperature I'm using today, it would take over an hour to ramp up from cold to the temperature. And with this, today it took me about 12 to 14 minutes. So it also greatly reduces your electricity bill too because you're running it for significantly shorter amounts of time. It also cools down a lot faster if you choose to temper with your heat treat oven as well. So I can go from 1900 degrees down to 400 in about 15 to 20 minutes whereas other ovens would take forever even if you left their doors open. Um, I also like this top sliding door. It's more convenient, takes up less space because it's not swinging out. And I know I'm never gonna scrape my elbow up against a hot brick. So that's also a big deal. I have this uh, pre-programmed with settings so that I can just key them in very quickly and pull them up for my more commonly used steels. I love that digital face on there. And uh, here we go, it's time to start the, the quenching process. I'm using aluminum plates vertically because if you lay a, an aluminum plate down like most makers do, then lay a blade on top of it, then go get your top plate and put it on, it's actually soaking heat out of the bottom before you get to that top one, and it can actually start warping your steel. This way, you're compressing both sides together at the same time, and you're drawing the heat out evenly, so it's much less likely to ever warp. Then you use the compressed air to, to force it to cool even faster. And then you're well on your way to being able to get it out of the bag and start playing with your, your knife, getting it into temper and starting to do the hard work. So now I've cooled it down pretty well. It's still not cool enough to touch. I could hold the bag because aluminum, the aluminum foil immediately cools down. There you can see the suction you can see the form of the knife all the way around. That means it did its job when I put that paper in there and the way that I crimped everything up, it was nice and airtight. It's been a couple hours now and the AC is struggling. It can't get below 101 degrees ambient temperature in there. Oh my God, it's insane. And here I'm just gonna use these snips to go ahead and cut it open. And then I kind of use a, a, a twist and roll method to, to peel the rest of it away. Um, you don't really want to mess with this stuff without wearing gloves. I usually wear cut-proof gloves because the foil is actually razor sharp and can slice right the hell through you. It's crazy. So let's get this bad boy out and see if it colored up nicely and get a nice even heat treat. And now we'll double check just to make sure nothing warped, make sure it's still at least mostly flat. It's still gonna be surface ground again later, no big deal. And now it's time to go off to temper, two cycles of two hours each at 400 degrees. What you doing? Oh, just baking cookies, see? Wait, 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 wait! That's my little boy Strider. He wanted to play along. I'll see you guys on the next video, where we'll do all the real hard work.